as a young man and what your values will be when you move forward and the character you will have and the way you deal with kindness and compassion and acceptance of others, that interests me more than your score in calculus. I'm a math teacher, so that's a big statement. <laughs> I'm not one who subscribes to you want your kids to follow in your path. I say no. I want them to make their own paths. I find that unhappiness sometimes comes in parallel with you not compromising something in your business, but compromising a value as you do business. I'd like to see more women who support women. Hmm. Hmm. I feel that's one of my targets in my schools is how to raise girls who support other girls. Welcome to another episode of Recipe to Success. It's been a little while, but I'm back with a bang and cannot have sat down with anyone better. I'm literally really, really excited for this one, by the way, guys. So without further ado, Alisar, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. I know it's the World Cup starting today, but you, you dropped everything and came here. So thank you so much. Well, you were kind enough to move the time because... Of yeah. course, of course, with uh, such a credible, uh, esteemed guest, I have to move things around, right? Thank you, sir. <laughs> I appreciate it. So um, let's start off by giving the people an introduction. Obviously, we have an audience in Dubai who already probably know who you are, but mm. we have a lot of uh, viewers and listeners in London as well. Mm. Um, so let's start off by, you know, an introduction. All right. Well, my name is Alisar Nasser. Um, I'm Lebanese by origin, but I've been in the UAE... 47 years now. Wow. I grew up here. I came when I was eight. Oh, that means now everyone knows I'm 55. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I graduated from high school here, studied in the U.S. for four years, came back, and I always knew I'd be in education ever since I was young. I had this nag for being a teacher. Uh, right now, I am the chief academic officer for al Mawakib schools, which are historically iconic schools in Dubai. And uh, I think no matter what I do, where I go, at heart, I will always be a teacher first. And so this is where we are right now. So I'm just a humble teacher who was lucky enough to be where I am today. Amazing. And you mentioned that you came to Dubai or the UAE, you know, a very long time ago. Um, you've probably seen it evolve so much. Oh, did I ever? It was, okay, like when I first arrived in Dubai, it was uh, what people used to imagine Dubai was, uh, only desert, it was. You know, it was where you'd have only one hospital. We all went to Suq Mirshid to shop there, whereas nowhere else. Um, yeah, it was nothing, it was desert. Mm -hmm. It was a few buildings and the clock tower of Deira. Uh, so it's quite remarkable to have been part of this journey for this incredible country, honestly, to have seen it all. Mm. Yeah, I consider myself privileged that way. So, you know, I was around when Sheikh Rashid, uh, may he rest in peace, used to go to the Deira markets in Su Mirshid, sit on top of a wooden platform and talk to all the wow. businessmen down there. They sat all around him and we'd go down there and I'd watch him. And I used to see him with Sheikh Muhammad and his children walking around, talking to people. Wow, that's inspiring. Yeah. So you said um, from a very young age, you knew you wanted to be a teacher. How did that? Let's talk about that a little bit, because okay. most people, they don't know what they have any idea of what they want to do. When well, older. I guess it was well, the, I'm told a story. Um, when I was in fourth or fifth grade, um, uh, my father was the principal of the school and uh, he was receiving a lot of complaints from parents that um, my class was getting a lot of homework from all subjects. Uh, complaints every day. This class, teachers are giving too much homework and uh, he's investigated and the teachers denied and no, it's not true. It rested for a while and then a week or two later, the same complaints started coming in. After further investigation, uh, the 
Reality emerged and it turned out I was the one giving homework to all my friends in class. Whoever needed uh, work in math, I gave them math, French, French, Arabic, Arabic, all subjects, mind you. So I was giving homework. I was grading it. I was uh, telling people, you didn't do well today. You have to do it again. So, yeah, I was teaching as a fourth grade. <laughs> so so I, you, I knew it was going to happen. I knew. I love it. I love uh, being around, you know. Passing on knowledge, let me say. It started off with, I like seeing people do better. And uh, I can't think of another sector where that is fast, tangible. You see it right away. You know, any kid who comes to you any day in a school, uh, within 24 hours, you've already impacted them. And so I don't know any other sector that can see immediate results when they do something. Do you think that's innate? Because I'm always fascinated by people that choose career paths and stick to that career path their whole life and they you know for me for example you know even when I was young I, I always knew I wanted to go into business and people ask me why and sometimes I, I genuinely don't know where it started but you you have that similar path where you knew okay cool like this is what I want to go into do you think that's something you were born with or I think for some people you could say it's innate uh, a lot of it has to do sometimes with what's around us, right? The environment I grew up in was always geared towards education. My parents were teachers, grandparents teachers, uh, but my brothers didn't end up being teachers. So uh, part of it, innate, I would say, is whether you end up loving what you decided you want to do all your life. Because you could think I want to do it, but you might en not enjoy it, right? Uh, but I did it, and while I thought it was hereditary in the in the beginning, turns out no, I love it. So I came back and I taught for a year, and then the second, and then I was like, okay, no, I didn't inherit this. I like it. I think I'll stick to it. And for some people, no, it might not be innate, but you can work on it. I feel that, like any career you choose, um, you can work on it so that it becomes something you love. I don't know if you've heard about me lo a lot, but uh, I'm not very big on find your passion. Okay. I'm, I'm not an advocate of find your passion. I'm sorry. Tell me more. I don't believe in it. Um, I think, I think find your, like people who come speak in my school, usually I usually tell them, please don't say that message to my students. I feel like if you have a passion, great. That's wonderful. Go for it, pursue it do it. But if you don't, it's okay. And when you say to kids who are five or six or 12 or 14, find your passion, you're giving them more pressure and you're putting on them more pressure than they already have. Find my passion means what? Where do I look for it? Exactly. Does anyone have the recipe, since you're looking for recipes, mm -hmm. of how to find a passion? So I say, no, I'm more about build your skills, build your knowledge, uh, become a relations person, no matter what your sector in your sector is, and learn to love what you do, so that you uh, wake up in the morning excited to go to do your job. Because somewhere down the line, you might actually find out that your passion is to doodle, so that's in your free time, or to fish. So hopefully, your job can guarantee a, a, a financial independence that can grant you a passion pursual. So I'm for innate can be built so that you learn to love what you do or like it a lot at least so that you can eventually maybe give time to something you are passionate about. And if you don't find that passion, what's the problem, Yanni? A lot of people are living very happy lives without having discovered a specific passion. Because today, today, right now, I'm having a passion, uh, you know, t towards uh, organizing my garden for the World Cup. I don't subscribe to this, you know, you have one passion and you pursue it. I think it's not static and you have to be open to, you know, replacing passions or adding them on. What's the problem? What What's about, this pressure of one passion? What about purpose? Do you think we all have a purpose? I mean, sure, some of us may realize what it is and therefore pursue it or, you know, live it. And some may not, but others, through their knowledge of us, may find it. So, like, if you ask me, do I have a purpose? Um, I think one human purpose for everyone 
I hope, don't I think, I don't think should, but I hope would be kindness and compassion in whatever you do and whatever you're doing. So if everyone adopts kindness and compassion as their purpose, no matter what they're doing, I'm thinking we would be doing better as a race, as a planet, as communities. But if our purposes are always geared towards individuality, uh, I think this is why we're in trouble right now, right? Yeah, that's true. Mm. There's a lot of things that affect that. Um, we talked uh, a bit off camera about some of the amazing alumni you have. Um, and obviously that, that list is endless, you know, whether it's mm. Rashid Belhasa, whether it's Dr. Muhammad Aji that obviously, you know, put us together, whether it's, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure that the list is endless. Um, my question is, when you m- meet these kids from a young age and they grow up to then, you know, choose a certain path and some of them get fame, some of them get success, whatever they kind of aspire to achieve. Is there some consistencies that you see, like from a young age, from as, as from when they're at a young age, or is it that they just evolve? Because, you know, for me, there were certain things that I felt like I had as a kid, but I needed to be nurtured, I needed to be around the right people, I needed to have good teachers um, around me. And in the UK, it's a little bit different because... There's a lot of teachers that just become teachers just for the paycheck or just, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a decent career path. They don't really care about impact, like you said, and they don't realize the responsibility that they have. Um, so take yourself back to that time, like, a, you know, the, the endless alumni you have. Is there consistencies? In some cases, yes, because you'd find me often like we had before we started this podcast. Uh, you'd s- describe Muhammad uh, in certain ways. And I said to you, yeah, that's him. Uh, the kindness, the the generosity, the authentic nature, the strength in character. And so some, I would say to you, yeah, he was always like that. Uh, but that's not always the case. And I'm happy to report to you that the positive surprises are way more than the disappointing ones. So we've often been wonderfully surprised by kids who maybe were on the reticent side of life, on the, you know, introverted side of life who, and that's fine because that could be what they need, who evolved to become amazing outgoing characters and, uh, you know, successful in whatever they're doing. Uh, So I'd say, yeah, some of it is recognizable. Some traits do remain. And I think that has to do with family status and the people you surround yourself with and definitely the school has a lot to do with it i was at a wedding of one of my alumni last night it could have easily been a reunion and joyce graduated 20 years ago and all these girls and boys who were at the wedding it was as if they picked up where they left off so in our schools it was always about building an ethos of your girl you're expected to always be there for each other the same way you are in school, leaning on each other, supporting each other and getting support from us. So their journeys, like I say to them and like our leadership teams who are awesome in the school say to the kids, your story with us does not end when you graduate. Once I give you that diploma and you're off, you're not off. I'm still here. And if you need anything, come back. So when you believe in this, the, the message goes down, right? And the kids feel it and they embrace it and they live it. And so years later, they're building businesses together. They're still there for each other. They're at each other's weddings. They're, they talk about their teachers in ways that baffle kids like uh, From the West, yeah. who grew up who's like, what? We've never been back to our high school. And I'm like... I can't get rid of the alumni who come visit us all the time, and I don't want to. Um, the, the best part about this is we've transcended that relationship so that I've become uh, someone they know they can lean on. But the better part is they have become adults that I know I can lean on, too. So I pick up the phone, you know, I say, hint, you know, hint, Siddiqui, hint, I need before I finish the sentence, she says, whatever you want. Um, 
you know, I pick up the phone to say to Arif, who is the CEO of the IFC, you know, Arif, whatever. It's nice, uh, but it's also done with uh, absolute faith that it only serves a purpose that is good for everyone. All right. So, yeah, I have, uh, I'm lucky, blessed. And, you know, a lot of people, and I say that a lot, uh, I was talking about it yesterday, you know, the compliment is, oh, Miss Arisar, you're unique because no one else does this in Dubai. Your schools are the only, the only Mawakib. That's awesome. And I'm like, okay, you know, you think you're complimenting me. But actually, it makes me sad because I keep thinking, why? Why is it unique and shouldn't be unique? We're educators. It's not about a bottom line in education. We're, it's about investing in human relations, not in human grades. And investing in every kid so that they know, no matter what, family or no, this family will always be there for. How difficult is this? In, in practical terms, what it costs me is just decision to give time to this and to be there. What? It's not difficult. So no, I don't comprehend why it's unique. And I, I'm sad that it's unique. I'm but, happy for my students, mm -hmm. but I'm sad that you don't have that experience and that a lot of people don't have that experience. Why don't they? Why shouldn't they? Definitely. Right. And, and I think it is unique, you know, especially from mm. the world that I come in. And it is unfortunate because, you know, you never really have that relationship with your teachers like that in, in the West or in the, in the UK because... You know, you go to school and you leave school and that's it. Like they were just your teachers yeah. and, and you don't really, and, and you leave not really having anyone to lean on in that sense, unless you go out and search for them. So that, that's super interesting. Do you think that is a culture at this school in particular or, you know, the, the schools that you guys ha have been a part of? Or do you think that is more kind of normal in this part of the world? I can't speak for other schools. But I know that I always hear that, yeah, a lot of schools have some of it, but we are more prominent that way, uh, very humbly. Um, yeah, and I'm proud of that. Um, our alumni, every year, Hamza, I welcome more than 100 to 150, maybe 200 in some cases, alumni on campus doing not just a visit, giving back in the form of a workshop, in the form of distributing awards, in the form of playing a game, in the form of, you know, and recently, well, recently, seven years ago now, we formed a group called AMSI Voices. So this is an, an alumni-initiated uh, group whose job it is and focus it is to give back to the school community. So every year we, I'm in the group, but they do all the stuff. Um, every year they... Um, organize a conference. They invite 30, 35 alumni who speak on panels and then have breakout sessions for all the seniors in our three campuses. In addition to that, we have online Monday 101 sessions where, again, all the seniors are online with these alumni who teach them specific skills. So these are not lectures, specific skill. So our alumni are very... Uh, engaged in our school communities and that's phenomenal and you know it's kind of funny because the best comment i ever got in one of the conferences after we were done and these are conferences you know that i have alumni from all sectors represented and it's amazing women men you know everything ministers pilots um, how you know moms it doesn't have to be and this is where i'm gonna have a beef with you about the <laughs> definition of success. And so one of the girls, this is about six years ago, she stands up and it's, you know, we're running out of time for her. So I hope she gets in touch soon. She stood up at the end of the conference and she said, Miss Aysar, because I said, what, how do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Even though I think it's a very silly question, but she stood up and she said, Miss Aysar, I hope in 10 years I'll be sitting at my office uh, uh, in a very good position with a picture of my family in front of me and the phone rings and I pick up and you say to me so and so 
uh, we're having the next MC Voices conference and I want you to be a voice. And I will be on that stage with you. I'm like, wow. The kids have started to want to be inspirers Mm. already. But you know what's the best part of these conferences, Hamza? So every year I got like 30, 35 alumni who come thinking we're going to inspire the kids. Walking away, being inspired by these kids. Wow. Yeah. And it's stunning. I'm so proud of both ends. I'm blessed. That's Lucky. amazing. And you know, for, for me, education has always been something that has not really changed much, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in our part of the world anyway, where I think that's where a lot of the demotivation comes from is, you know, education should evolve with time. Education should be multifaceted. It shouldn't be just, you know, the academic maths, English, science, because not everyone is, is good at that. And, you know, we've seen, um, you know, in the business world and, you know, in other parts of the world as well, in, in different industries, that people do reach, you know, success, if you want to say, quote unquote, um, without, you know, having that, you know, that traditional kind of education. Um, and, and I think that that message has kind of got blurred as well, because then people assume that, OK, I don't need education at all. Whereas education is merely just kind of growing your knowledge. It doesn't have to be one thing or the other. Um so do you think that's a big part of, of um, the growth that, you know, the, ki- you know, the children here that grow up to become the things that they do is that it's not just the traditional hmm. uh, kind of. It's not walk- just academic. Yes, call it that. exactly. So for me, what's the definition of education in the end, right? For me, education in our schools is a social experience. But it's enhanced with the academic experience not the other way around a lot of people will argue with me oh what about it? i guarantee none of my students will graduate except very strong in reading and writing and arithmetic all right so literacy numeracy fine but beyond that yes i am more interested in how you are growing as a gentleman as a young man and what your values will be when you move forward and the character you will have and the way you deal with kindness and compassion and acceptance of others, that interests me more than your score in calculus. I'm a math teacher, so that's a big statement. (laughs) All right. So a lot of people will argue that if there was one academic system on the planet that was perfect, everyone would be doing it. Ask yourself this. How come we have so many systems? Why don't we all agree on one academic system? Partly because, first of all, all these academic systems that we have in place, they're not, they haven't been around that long, huh? Like some don't go further than the 80s, 1980s. So what people sometimes forget and ignore, which I hope they stop, is it's a work in progress. So let's not think of it as set in stone and this is how it's supposed to be. So for me, yeah. If my students are happy and enjoy waking up to come to school, understand that there will be days when they don't want to come, but that's okay because eventually when they come, we'll talk it out. And they know that their voice is heard. And they know if they cannot talk to you, they can talk to me. And if they cannot talk to me, they cannot. They can talk to him. And there's always someone they can talk to. That's good. Now let's talk math, English, Arabic, French, science, whatever. But first that. And so what's funny is in Mawakib, in our schools, that's always been how we are. You know, well-being has always been in our ethos. Now it's... It's a trend. Now it's, a tr- it's becoming the law. And I'm thinking actually the fact that we reached a stage in our lives where you have to regulate well-being tells you we were on the wrong track on a lot of places. So I'm glad the world is making a U-turn to what we've always been in Malacca. And a lot of people tried to change us, you know, but I, we stood our ground because we believed, and my father has a lot to do with this. He always believed uh, that how can you teach them if they are not happy? That's I amazing. I, I was actually going to, that was a perfect segue. I, I wanted to talk about your childhood a little bit. Yeah. Um, 
you know you you mentioned earlier that you know you found your calling a little bit at a young age and your parents um were teachers and you were in that world but how was your childhood in general and what were some of the things that you learned to become the amazing woman that you are today oh first of all thank you <laughs> <laughs> um my childhood was very happy so i have two older brothers but my parents I never felt that as the girl in the family uh, uh there were less lower expectations for me. Actually, I felt very much more powerful. My dad was my my rock. He was, you know, Ali Sar. So, and my brothers were the kind of men in my life that believed in uh, strong women as well. So, I guess I was lucky, but again, I wish the situation stops becoming lucky and starts becoming normal um so my childhood was one of uh you know my parents would often stay um late at work because it was a new school in dubai and whatever but i would be home reading writing lyrics of songs that's how my english became stronger mm. that was how i worked i think on my english because i went to the us with exactly the same accent you're hearing right now So they were always trying, it's like, you know, Elvis Presley, boom, boom, boom. John Denver, you know, I'm sure everyone hasn't heard of them out there, but <laughs> that's what I was doing, you know. It was, you know, that's all we had, you know, the Beatles, you know, write the lyrics. We didn't have Shazam. So my childhood, I spent a lot of time on my own reading. I read a lot when I was a kid, I still do. Um, I loved um, studying I'm not ashamed. I know we're shamed for this. But by that I meant I loved, you know, my math. I loved doing my I loved my science. I loved my English. I, I was a the I, I loved being a student. And that I carried that on in my university years but with a little bit more partying. <laughs> so um I played sports. I loved tennis. I made my college tennis team. Um But I was also kind of like, a, unfortunately, what they called a tomboy in those days, which I now reject as a term. It just meant that it means I like to play football with the boys. So I was a tomboy. Um, my daughter doesn't have to suffer this, alhamdulillah. So pleasant childhood, very happy memories. My dad and mom, because she's actually what made him remain the rock that he is, um, Any time they spared any change, it was to, you know, my dad took us skiing in Faraya in Beirut when we were kids, when, you know, that was only for the rich, but he would, you know, make enough to make sure we got that experience. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm very happy. As a child, I was a happy child. That's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what lessons are you now passing on to your children? From that. You would think I know how to do it better, no? <laughs> but you know, I think uh, uh, I always say this and, you know, my, I have two boys and a girl and they're super awesome. Uh, my oldest, uh, Omar, is uh, a lot of people would uh, say to, him, to me that he has a lot of my personality and, you know, very organized and to the point and, you know, doesn't very a man of integrity. Um. Hala is a rebel. Uh, I was a rebel on so many levels. She doesn't think she's like me, but I think she's a lot like me. She just doesn't know it yet. And if she hears this, she's going <laughs> to... Ziad is the affectionate one. He's like the glue of the whole family, not just my family. Um, lessons I pass on? I don't know. I don't want to pass on any lessons. I want to have no expectations of them. I want them to build their own expectations. I'm not one who subscribes to you want your kids to follow in your path. I say no. I want them to make their own paths. I believe that they don't belong to me. They don't belong to me. They're my kids, but they belong to life. And that's how they have to live it. But I'm there for them, whatever they need, whenever they need. So this is... Uh, so that your audience doesn't think I'm plagiarizing. Uh, this is the infamous Khalil Gibran in his book, The Prophet, where he writes in Arabic, 
أولادكم أبناء الحياة So in English, your children are not yours Your children are the children of life And I believe in that You know Wow, that's beautiful mm. You should read the book Yeah, definitely mm. <laughs> I'm sure you've got a long list of books that I need to read Oh, yeah, be kind <laughs> Actually, I'm going to gift you one before you travel Oh, so sweet right. of you. I have to bring you You are editing, so you can cut stuff out, right? I have, you have to come to the school during the week if you have time I'll walk you through so that you see what I'm talking about. Mm, that would be, be good amazing. to capture some footage for yeah, you. Yeah, that would be mm. amazing. So going back to what you mentioned a little bit earlier about passion and, um, you know, you, wanted, you want people to be happy and you want people to also know that, you know, they wake up happy and they look forward to their day. That's quite interesting to me because there are a lot of people that, you know, don't have that, right? They, they don't wake up happy they don't look forward to what they're doing and they, you know they're just coasting through life i want to talk about happiness and contentment in general um because obviously you've seen so many kids you've you know got your own you've had your own life experience as well um and you know i know you mentioned that we all have our days but you know it's, it's important to talk what do you think is the key to finding your happiness and contentment. Because as I get older as well, I start to realize that a lot of it is down to your own kind of process. Like you have to identify and, and be able to accept that you want to be happy. Like happiness can be a choice to a certain extent. So what are your thoughts on that? And, and, and how would you guide people in finding their happiness and, and contentment? First of all, I love what you just said. I love it. Um, but I would say for me, I got it wrong for a while. I'd say I used to think that my happiness, my job is to make others happy. Um, but in, in, no, your job is to take care of you. So I think for me, happiness comes from connections, from relations, from giving. These are the things that make me happy. My connections, my relations, my giving. Um, it's not about possessions, for sure. A lot of people are mistaking it for that. You know that. Mm -hmm. So I say invest in people, not in things. Invest in relations. Take that time to pick up the phone and call. You are so lucky as a generation that has easier access and more fluid uh, approach to building relations. And, uh, take care of your health. And I think it's as simple as that. Find joy in the simple things, um, in, the, in cooking your own food, you know, in watching a movie with friends, simple things. It's not all about extravagance. Um, those should become like the exception, not the norm. And yeah, dive into a book and find happiness in that. So for me, relations, connections, your own personal happiness will automatically, I think, uh, it, 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 what's that word in English? It will project on others. But don't make it your mission to go out and make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Like you, you are the person that so many people lean on. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with dark days? I like my alone time. I do. So I'm very happy to just uh, sit somewhere where I'm not easily reached physically. So and take a book, listen to some music, see the sun, go to the sea. Yeah, listen to music, meditate a little bit in my room. So I like my alone time, but I'm 55. So I don't know if I believe if I had been doing this since I was younger, I would have lesser of those days. So I recommend you start early on this. It's never, you know, look, alone doesn't mean lonely. huh? So for me, being alone is something I cherish. I do. I appreciate my time with the... <laughs> um, a few, a couple of months ago, I took a retreat for myself in Ras al-Khaimah in a hotel. 
And people are saying, who are you there with? I said, I'm there with me, myself, Am Omar, Alisar, and I. All five of us are enjoying each other's company. <laughs> so, you know, you can be alone and not lonely and just, you know, go back inside and, and, and see. And then don't keep anything bottled in. One of, the, one of the main hindrances, if you want, of happiness and joy is swallowing a lot of stuff without, and then your stomach is going to hurt. So now let it out. I'm not saying be impolite or scream at people, but you know, if something is bothering you, you need to let it out. So I'm also, even though I haven't done, gone down that path yet, I think if you're having bad days or consistent bad days, you should seek help. You should seek therapy because therapy, I think, is good for all of us these days. We all could use a little therapy. So don't hesitate to ask for help. Okay? Mm. Don't. It's, it's very silly. It just delays your okayness unnecessarily. Just reach out. Do you think that there's times in your life especially in certain career paths like business for example is very difficult at times right mm. do you think that happiness is a consistency or do you think that it just ebbs and flows and you have to accept hardship as well and that you know life is not going to be an easy you know easy ride it's there's going to be things that you have to accept there's going to be things that you have to be willing to sacrifice and trade off and 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 knowing even if if it makes you unhappy that you are on this goal of what you want to achieve. Well, you said a lot of correct things in that sentence. So my, I don't have an answer for you, but I have a, you're right. But I do think, yes, I am a happy person, but there will be times when I have things that make me a little bit, uh, I don't want to say unhappy, but they will, you know, cramp my style. Um, so I think, uh, if you if your values are unshakable and you um, embrace them and adhere to them, there shouldn't be much disruption in your happiness. I find that unhappiness sometimes comes in parallel with you not compromising something in your business, but compromising a value as you do business. So you want to watch out with what are your I like values? that. That was very deep. You think? I like that, yeah. It took 45 minutes for you to find depth? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> All right. So I do. I think um, take a step back. Reevaluate the situation and figure out what is it that got you there. All right. And I'm not here talking about, you know, you're driving and you got a flat tire. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, you're driving and you don't know where you're going. So... Specific, what are your values in the end? And so if everything you do is, you know, rooted in your values, there shouldn't be much. Something just happened. No? There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be much uh, disruption that is extreme. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, ready to have a, our beef now? About yes, success. let's have a beef. <laughs> Um, so wait, just a disclaimer, by the way, okay? <laughs> yes. um, so, uh, you know, going back to different episodes, I definitely don't think that success, there's right or wrong answer. And there's one answer. I think it's definitely subjective. I've sat with so many different people. For some people's financial, for some people's family, for some people's happiness. Um, and it varies. And, you know, one of my questions I ask people is, you know, what does success mean to you? Because it does differ, right? Um, but I think the world or the social media world or even just, you know, people's perception is that, you know, success does have a lot to do with money, right? Whether it's the truth or not. Um, so just a little disclaimer that I don't just think that success you're, is you're money. You're getting away <laughs> with that one. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so for me, so you're saying what, how do I define success? Now that I know that you are very fluid in your definition, I define my success by the success of people around me. So every time one of my team or one of my students or one of my alumni or one of my family succeeds, I call it an accolade for me too. Uh, and now what, how do they succeed? 
whatever definition they have suits me. And it goes back to if they're happy. So for me, success is achieving happiness and a peace of mind. So do you go to sleep with a clear conscience? That's success. Do you go to sleep knowing you've led a, a life of kindness, compassion, integrity, honesty? You're successful. So it's not about positions. Because for me, you know, from, you know, mom at home to Uber driver to the guy who serves your coffee at, uh, you know, your local coffee shop. All of them could be successful. This is why this is another thing I have a beef with, with people, which is, you know, who's your role model, Ms. Aysar? Because, you know, you're supposed to pick a successful role model. I don't have a role model. I think it's impossible for me to decide who's my role model. And a lot of the time with role models, you don't have full context. You might think that they're role models. It's what you see on the surface, right? And so for me, today, uh, you, you're my role model. I'm loving how you're talking. For a 26-year-old, I'm very impressed. Thank and you. I'm, yeah. Um, earlier today, it was my sister-in-law who said something really amazing. You know, uh, uh, at so many levels, my mom is my role model in a lot of things. My dad. My brothers, my husband, my kids, my kids every day. So why do I have to stick to one? So I say the bottom line is success is walking in your own shoes with your head held up high, knowing you've done things right with kindness, with compassion. You didn't hurt anyone. You didn't get somewhere at the expense of someone. Um, you didn't abuse you are just, and that's it. That's success with a dash of happiness. I love that because a lot of people can shame those that don't have the titles, the positions, the money. Shame on them. Right? Um, and I think a lot of the younger generation as well, it's all they see. I mean, even for you, from an education point of view, technology must have changed things a lot because now we have so much access to information. We see so many lies we see you know what people want to portray as opposed to what they're living in reality and um, unfortunately a lot of the kids do see them as role models I think um, there was a, stati a statistic in uh, uh, the US and they asked the kids you know what um, do you want to become when you're older and the most commonly answered question was an influencer YouTuber yeah YouTuber social media influencer um, and that was fascinating for me because it's only what they see, right? And they think, okay, yeah, I want to be like this person because, you know, they're on YouTube and I, I watch them on YouTube and I have a laugh and, you know, they're successful and whatever it may be. But they don't know their peace of mind. They don't know their mental clarity. They don't know what they've really achieved. They don't know what they think before they go to sleep. Um, and most people, you know, intentionally don't ever reveal those things because they don't want to change that status of, of, of their role model or being a role model. I mean, unless when they mess up, uh, a lot of these influencers say, oh, I never, you know, wanted to be a role model. I never intended to be a role model. I just happened to be a role model or, or you know, people just look up to me. Um, so with that in mind, how do you then inspire the new generation where things have changed so drastically with technology, with everything that I mentioned? Well, let me start by saying I think we are underestimating how intelligent they are. I don't want to comment on the U.S. statistic. It's a U.S. statistic. But I'd say from my knowledge of the students I know, oh, no, they're way smarter than that. I hate it when, when a lot of adults pick on this new generation. Oh, they're into... So Yes, they are. So? They are awesome young people. Like, if I'm telling you what a pleasure it is for me every day if I get the honor to have a bunch of my students, juniors, seniors, whoever, sitting around me and we're having a conversation, you would be shocked by the level of maturity, responsibility, stuff we didn't even know it even possible for this age group 20, 30 years ago. So no, I'm not worried about this generation. And wherever they're in, 
guess whose fault it is? My generation. So no, I'm not going to give them that burden. And I think they're very smart in terms of social growth and development. And I'm actually counting on them. Because my grandchildren, they will be the leaders when they, when they are born. So I'm counting on this generation to actually turn the mess we made around. So um, I, this statistic is sad for the United States, but I will keep it in the United <laughs> States, <laughs> not here. And as a woman in power uh, and someone who didn't necessarily have that burden by your parents that, you know, just because you're a woman that you can't do certain things. And having seen the world change so much in that regard as well, that, you know, women have a lot more rights, women have a lot more freedom, they can do what they want, they can wish as they do as they wish. Where does that go next? And because I, I think there's a lot of kind of miscommunication now um, between men and women, right? There's a, there's a lot of um, inconsistencies, especially in the West, where I think, you know, they just dis disagree on things for no reason, right? It's like, you know, why are we fighting about some of the things? Why are we arguing about that women should have certain rights and, and men shouldn't, right? Um, so as a woman in power, I know this is a, a topic that's very important to you. Um, so how do you see things evolving further? And are you happy? Are you proud to see some of the changes that have happened for, for women over the past maybe 10 years? Absolutely happy. But you use the word we have more rights, more because we have a lot less than we should. And we're so far from achieving the equity we should have. So again, it's about equity, not equality. I don't want to be equal to you, mm. but I want to be treated with equity. Um, as, a, as, a, as a woman in power, you know, because I don't sit with that many females, unfortunately, you know, you're going to help me now. Yes, uh, I am. And, get, you know, mm. and allow me to tap into to their minds as well. But I, obviously as a man, I want to act like I'm ignorant in the sense of, um, you know, not knowing the, the hardships that women can go through, especially in positions of power so what are some of those things that you feel like ne you didn't necessarily have or the equity that you didn't have because I'm actually intrigued <sighs> among other things Hamza you have to understand as a man the, the second you were born you were already privileged because you were a boy the small fights uh, are when you're in a room and it's uh, full of men and your voice needs to be heard, but there's a lot of uh, echo and it doesn't get heard. And how do you fight it? You raise your voice and you raise it higher until you start getting called aggressive, right? So the fight is, we have a long way to go. One of, I was not, I want to say I'm lucky again because I came into a position immediately because my father believed in me. So this is a man who believed in a woman. While I love that, uh, we have a lot of men now who believe in women's voice and know that it's to your advantage that women come into their positions in our society. Um, I'd write, I'd like to see more women who support women. Hmm. Mm. I feel that's one of my targets in my schools is how to raise girls who support other girls. Because that's, you know, it's, it's hard enough having to fight against the men. We don't want to fight against each other. So that's been a challenge too. So... Some of the surprising things as I rose, if you want, in, in the ranks was um, the pushback from women, unfortunately. So I've adopted that as a cause. Uh, and everyone who knows me knows, especially the females in my life, that you know, if I ever hear of 
a woman coming in the way of another woman. That just eggs me more than a man. Because I, I, I expect the man and I'll handle the man. But the women. Playing devil's advocate here. Um, mm. And again, you know, with limited kind of knowledge on this topic. Um, one argument would be that women step on each other's toes because there is not enough room for every woman, if that makes sense. So, for example, if you're in a room surrounded by men, they feel that to be that woman in the room, I have to step on another woman's toes in order to be that woman in the room. Because the other guys won't move. Hmm. All right. So what we need to do is you need to stop looking at the women in your target. You know, not, they're not the bullseye. I want you all to move forward, but not at the expense of other Each women. Other. Hmm. Take your position by merit, not by sexism, by merit. Let's go back to basics. So make sure you're dealing uh, with uh, a, a board meet. Yeah, let's take our place at the table, but let's not fight other women for it. There are another 12 men at the table. Pick one of them, you know, <laughs> and we can. That. And here is where the patriarchal mentality comes into play because these men it's a boys club it's very difficult to break into a boys club some it's difficult for some boys never mind the girls so i believe education is the key so if all the schools adopt this attitude of allowing the girls to shine allowing the girls to be proud to be girls we've reached a stage where some girls are like now resentful of being girls. No, I want to go be proud to be a girl and be proud to have a voice. And I tell the parents, like, stop telling her to be quiet. Stop telling her to grow up to be a princess. And no, come on. Why, why are the t-shirts in, in clothes stores, you know, superhero for the boy, princess for the girl? You know, astronaut, future scientist, future unicorn. I don't know what. Why? Right. All, it's, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. So at least in our schools, let's give the girls a voice and let it be heard and let us not judge. This is the next point and this is very important, huh? a space free of judgment. For example, okay, okay. You're such a girl. What a, what a horrible sentence. Or you tell the boy, stop crying like a Man girl. Up. Man up. Hmm? Stop. You should see that. I will show you an ad later after this that tells you this. You should look it up. The like a girl ad. It's even the terminology we're using, you know, have to be careful with it. Mm. And it's deep. It's um, embedded in mm. society, you know, whoever whoever's intention that was once upon a time, but it's words, words are so empowerful, so powerful, so impactful. So be careful. So I said, be careful. How you how are you talking to your children before you send them out in the world? And how are you making sure your girl girls out there knowing she's as strong as everyone else? And how do you raise boys, and that's even more important, who support their sister, who allow her voice to be heard, who are not hiding or quiring, some, quiring somewhere when they hear their daughter or their sister, you know, being the number one speaker in the school. Why? So supportive boys, strong girls, especially when they're siblings, it's a very strong beginning for re- inventing the definitions of boys and girls in our societies in terms of equity. Hmm. And this is obviously a very important kind of cause to you because even uh, I saw your women in aviation video yeah. and, you know, you started off the speech by saying, you know, I'm not in aviation. Um, but what, why does that motivate you so much? I mean, you even going back to the earlier in the podcast, you talked about impact and you talked about, you know, having that impact. And at this kind of 
career that you've had, it's easy to kind of now, you know, chill. There's nothing, you know, you can easily get demotivated. You can easily feel like I've done my purpose. I've fulfilled everything that I need to do. I've been responsible for enough, uh, you know, mm. amazing young individuals that grew up to become adults. What keeps you going? And 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 why? Why? Why do you? Why do you fight for why for this? Get, why not? First of all, second of all, why? Because I want my daughter to grow up knowing there will be women in her life who will support her like I do, and there will be men who will support her like her father does, and there will be women who don't and men who don't. And so let's not lump them all in one basket. Let's identify the difference and then decide our course of action. So why do I do it? Because I wake up every morning and go to school and see these girls and see the potential and see the loss that we have as a society if that potential is not seen through and is not given a voice. I have, I know so many alumni who are women who, if they didn't find their voice, it would be a loss for you, you know? So if my mom hadn't been a voice at some point, how could I have reached where I reached? So I also have to give credit to women from our past who don't have what we have now, but they had made their sacrifices for us to be here. It's my turn, no? Because we're very far away. If you look at you and women's statistics, they will baffle you. We're over 200 years away from equity. 200 years. Mm -hmm. And COVID set us up, set us back another like 50 years, I think. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I could be at home chilling you're saying or doing nothing are you kidding me no this is i love what i do okay i love what i do so i may, it might not be what people call a passion but i'm definitely passionate and there's your difference you know so why not and why aren't more women doing this but i think more now than ever before so i'm happy and if my voice resonates with other women so that they use it to push, so be it. I'm happy to be that. I love that. And mm. what a fascinating conversation. Honestly, my my final um, kind of thought and question is, I'm a firm believer that you never stop learning, right? Obviously, I'm only 26, but I, I have the hope that I'll always continue to seek knowledge um and i don't claim i think nowadays everyone has an opinion on something mm. but you know articulating yourself without knowledge is is ignorance right and and you have to seek that knowledge and education is a lifelong process it shouldn't have to end when you know you you leave university or college or whatever it may be mm. so how important is that for you because obviously you've got a relationship with your alumni you've you've continued that relationship and you continuously surround yourself with them right as they become adults how important is that message to you of of continue don't just stop it's it's essential it's it's a if you don't why are you living really honestly um so for me no uh, i'm now learning a new language because i just want to learn spanish so i'm learning spanish um, but it doesn't stop there. Even the little things. Every day I learn from my students. And so it's it's the fun part of living, no? Knowing you have a chance to grow every day. Knowing, you know, Alisar today is one thing. And then as I walk out of this interview today with you, this podcast, I've already learned something. So you come in one thing and you go out one thing plus. So... You're always a better human being when you walk out having learned something. Definitely. You're 26, I'm 55, and I'm almost double your age. <laughs> and of course you have to embrace this as, as, you know, like a daily routine in your life. Asan, whether you know it or not, it's happening. But the depth of learning, that's a choice. How much you want to learn, how hungry you are to learn more, to build your knowledge about something you love or something you saw or something you heard, that's a choice. But to deny that you're learning every day, this is uh, ignorant in my opinion, because uh, whether you identify it, recognize it or not, you are learning. But you're, you know, when I came to you today, I learned how to get here. <laughs> 
So it could be as simple as that and it could be as deciding to 